I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals and Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Bree to like musical theater. How are we doing today, guys? Um... We're old. We're feeling (laughs) old as fuck. I'm 25, and I don't want to be 25, and I went on a big rant about it last night, but we won't have that rant here. And today's her birthday, too. I'm 25... And I don't know what I want to do with my life. You know, I want to be great. I want to be grand. But I don't know how to do it. Well, I can tell you how. Mm -hmm. Kill yourself. And then. Wow. You know, you don't age and you can die doing one big act. One big act. And wow, that'll be it. That sounds like a grand finale. I wonder if we'll get to see it. A huge climax. Are you going to be a bitch ass pussy and drop out? Yes. Oh, why you gotta do that? Come on. You gotta go settle down with this 25-year-old Bree and go live on a farm somewhere, you two? Yeah, it doesn't sound that bad. It sounds better than being dead. <laughs> <laughs> it does. And we'd have a dog, right? Or a dead duck? We'd no, have... We'd, have a f- we'd have a frog. Oh, okay, so you A want very a frog. big frog. You can't go change in our storyline like that, dude. It doesn't work that well, way. Well, I'm taking your clothes. I'm taking all your lights. Try living life without all that. Uh, well, those things aren't really necessary to live, so. I think we'll also, be okay. Didn't, didn't you want me to die like three minutes ago? You know what? We're doing Pippin this week, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and cue the music. is a 1972 musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Schwartz and a book by Roger O. Hearson. Bob Fosse, who directed the original production, also contributed to the libretto. The musical uses the premise of a mysterious performance troupe led by a leading player to tell a story of Pippin, a young prince on his search for meaning and significance. Pippin was originally conceived (laughs) as a student musical titled Pippin Pippin and performed by the Carnegie Mellon University's Scotch and Soda Theater Troupe. Stephen Schwartz collaborated with Ron Strauss, and when Schwartz decided to develop the show further, Strauss left the project. Schwartz had said that not a single line nor note from the Carnegie Mellon Pippin Pippin made it to the final version. Thanks, Bob Fosse. (laughs) <laughs> the protagonist Pippin and his father Charlemagne are characters derived from two real life individuals of the early Middle Ages. Though the plot is fictional and presents no historical accuracy regarding either, the show was partially financed by Motown Records, one of the only musicals to ever be done that way. Thanks, Detroit. Um, as of April 2019, the original run of Pippin is the 36th longest running Broadway show. Ben Vereen and Bettina Miller won Tony Awards for their portrayals of the leading player in the original Broadway production and the 2013 revival, respectively, making them the first actors to win Tonys for Best Leading Actor and Best Leading Actress in a musical for the same role. All right, that's the background history. And this is the time where I get to point out both of you actually watch Pippin. It's not just Andrew alone this time. I did. I took this. I took my birthday to watch Pippin. That's today. Yeah, I watched Pippin today. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm very curious as non-theater people. What is your guys' initial thoughts on Pippin? I loved Pippin. I thought it was great. I did, too. Honestly. And then so when I heard Corner of the Sky, I was brought back to high school because I sang that every single year of choir. And I had no idea that it actually came from that musical. I just liked all the tricks and the dancing, which is I know was Jess's favorite part as well. (laughs) <laughs> and for clarification we watched uh the 2013 revival production with patina miller who is absolutely incredible like her dancing ability literally had my jaw on the floor just she runs that show and it, it is truly incredible i, can, I, can I see think she's now. even better than ben vereen jess's jaw was on the floor and his eyes were like super angry because he's like why are they dancing <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't tend to like dancing in my musicals. I hate I dancing. 
I did feel like there were times where there was almost like prolonged dancing. I was like, why yeah. are they still dancing? Well, that's the point. My theory at this show, and I, I, I don't know if, if there's any confirmation on this, but I think Bob Fosse was on some sort of drugs and he's just like, more dancing. And that okay. was, that's the show. <laughs> we need more <laughs> dancing. Can I give a little, like, yes and to that? <laughs> sure. So, yes, Bob Fosse was always on drugs, for one. Yeah, that's yeah, very important to note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he came into this project... And the first written documentation of his opinion on it, he came in, read the script. It was right after Stephen Schwartz did Godspell, which was a huge hit off Broadway. And he sat down with the guy he wanted to be the lead actor with, and he read the script. And the lead actor said, I couldn't ignore how bad the script was. And he asked me how it was, and I didn't want Bob Fosse to think I was an idiot, but I also didn't want him to think I was shitting on this thing he liked. So I was like, I don't know about the book. He's And to which Bob Fosse replied, it's bullshit. We're going to fix it. <laughs> 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 and every day was him cutting the book to pieces and basically well, he absolutely destroying did fix it. it i mean he he took the book and he burned it and then he made a bunch of dancing and which that was, is basically that's what he show. did yes <laughs> <laughs> but like a lot of the brilliant decisions like the leading player was just a guy and he literally was like, you, you know we've seen chicago where it's like introducing billy Flynn. he was just like that yeah Nothing more. And Bob Fosse is like, nope, we need him to be a big thing. And then Stephen Schwartz is like, no, then Pippin has no agency in his own story and all this. And it's just the tug of war between those two. Where Bob Fosse won this really depressing, angry, moody piece reflective of the 1970s. And Stephen Schwartz just wanted a 50s musical. And they meet in the middle and it still doesn't really work. Jesse, I have a question. Yes. Do musicals typically break the fourth wall? They can, because it's one thing where they can do it very easily. Yeah. The one medium. OK, well, I noticed that they did it kind of like right away. If you are going to do it, do it right away is kind of where I sit on that. OK, OK. That was just a question of mine. I don't watch a lot of musical theater, so I needed to know. And this is a non-traditional musical. I think Andrew will agree with me there that this is not boilerplate stuff um no not really it's not like typical it feels very 70s i don't know maybe that's just because bob fossey's involved and he's he is the 70s i'm not now, sure this is this is only our second fossey musical we've ever covered yeah but i've watched uh i've watched the tv show now too i'm, I'm like an expert essentially <laughs> <laughs> are you now mm-hmm um, so, yeah, what is the plot of Pip and Andrew? I want you to tell me exactly what happens in this musical to the best of your ability. I mean, honestly, I don't think it's that hard because not very much happens. Uh, Pippin, Pippin doesn't know what he wants to be. Um, this is framed as a show within a show. So Pippin is the show that is being performed by the what would you call them? The the troop, the devil, yeah, the, the acting, the acting troop. Uh, so Pippin is being performed by the acting troop, um, sort of. And then Pippin doesn't know what he wants to be. And he goes to a bunch of different people. He goes to his dad and is like, man, I want to be like my dad. And he's like, actually, no, I don't want to be like my dad at all. Um, and then he goes to his grandma and he's like, I want to be like my grandma. And I think he does want to be like his grandma, but I'm not really sure. And then he meets a girl and he realizes that love is everything. But it takes him a little bit to, to realize it. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the show. I think there's not but really much else that happens. Does he love that girl? Yes. I don't know. I don't know if he loves that girl. I just think he didn't want to die. I think he did love the girl. I think it was just the easiest answer he had. Yeah, no, I, think... I disagree. The easiest answer he had was jumping into the fire. He, t he picked the harder answer. Jess just wants him to kill himself because Jess I don't. I don't. I actually think that it would be a much worse ending. So I don't believe that. I think let me be I very think clear deep about down, that. Jess does want him to kill himself, even if he doesn't admit it. I think that he does love the girl. The, the, the context, I think, is that he doesn't want to accept that he loves the girl because it's such a bland ending and he doesn't want to have a bland ending. But it is the ending that he he does want in the end. 
Um, he just didn't want to admit it. So Bob Fosse wanted him to jump in and die. Yeah, because and Bob Fosse doesn't allow himself to be happy. Yes, and that's kind of like the ongoing trait of his entire life leading up to the moment he dies in front of the yeah. production of Sweet Charity. So Cherry. Bob Fosse wanted himself to be Pippin, and everyone else is like, no. <laughs> But in my opinion, that is the quote unquote easy answer for a Broadway show is to have him do that. And that's it. But I feel like the less satisfying but harder to digest answer is him going off being unsatisfied. And not this wasn't in the production that we watched, but this was in the original 1972 production and was a big fight behind the scenes. Um, the produ this production has little boy Pippin, um, Theo come out and sing corner of the sky and all the demons come around him and accept him. That was not how the original production ended. It's a much better ending, but originally it ended with him just on the stage with Catherine and Theo. And she's like, how do you feel Pippin? He said trapped, but happy. And that's not too bad for a musical comedy. And then it just ended. That's a, that is a shitty ending. I hate that ending. Really? I like, cause I think it ruins the message. Now the message is, Oh, he's not actually happy. He's just being, a loser, I guess. Well, the but happy answer was the big fight. Bob Fosse wanted to keep it as trapped, and that's not too bad for a musical comedy. And everyone else was like, no, it ruins the entire message if you cut the but happy. I I think it's better if he actually is happy. And then it works better as a metaphor for um like youth and, and finding yourself. And that's why the demons go to the kid, because the kid has not found himself yet, and he's going to go on the same journey. And the demons are going to lead him on that journey. Uh, and he eventually will have to make the choice. Do I continue to follow these fucking demons that are <laughs> leading me to my death? Or do I finally decide that I want to be happy? <laughs> I mean, that's fair enough. Bree, what, what is your opinion on that ending? Like, would you have jumped into the flame to be living forever? Um, I didn't, I wouldn't have liked the ending if he would have jumped into the fire. I would have been like, okay, that's an easy out. Like, I didn't even expect him to be offered that in the end. Like, the, I told you, I thought he was going to join the demons, but like, not by jumping into a fire. Um, but I feel like I wasn't satisfied with the ending, like him almost like settling for this girl and her son. Like, I, I wasn't happy with that. Like See, he but talks you're, about finding his corner in the sky, guys. <laughs> that is his you're, corner of the you're sky. You're buying into the demon's portrayal, though. The demons are putting on the show. The demons are saying, oh, you're, if you went with that girl, you would be settling. That's not Pippin saying that. That's the demons who are putting on his show saying that. The demons who want him to jump into the fire. <laughs> but... <laughs> but he didn't seem happy with her because they don't want him to be happy with her they want him well, to jump into the pit of flames then comes the question because this is actually very important in the framing of the story Catherine is forced to be framed in a certain way by the leading player she is yes. forced to be nagging she is forced to do this when she doesn't want to exactly be. the she's demons going against the that. grain of the demons and trying to like, I th think that lends courtesy to what Andrew is saying. But on the other hand, he never got to meet the real girl then because she was shaped by the demons. I think she had enough there. And I think when he stands there and he's like, she has a mole on her face. That is the reality. And that's kind of what he likes about her. Loki, I took offense to that. I got a mole on my face. I got a mole everywhere. <laughs> I got a mole on my <laughs> face, just one too. big mole. <laughs> I'm a mole. <laughs> okay, who's ever doing fan art, please just draw Andrew as one big mole with two little legs, please. I feel like it'd be funny if I was just a mole. Like, but make sure that the, the ground, hair is like ground. correct. Right, but okay. Also, if you're gonna draw him as a mole, I want you to draw him as a mole on my face. <laughs> oh no, that's weird. That's like I weird. ship this. This is my new ship. Yeah, I don't know about that. Okay, I got one Mole right here. Andrew I got a little it. Monroe. Okay, I'm done. I'll oh cut boy. this out if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we keep it in. Okay. Um, the next question I actually want to bring up is actually an anecdote about the original production. So there's the moment when the leading player turns to the audience and asks, would anyone like to volunteer? 
in the original production, people would get up. Yeah. There is a story of Ben Vereen, who is the original leading player, who had this teenager come up on stage shaking, thinking he's about to kill himself. And he had to pull himself, pull him into the wings and be like, yo, this is just a show. Come on. <laughs> and a little girl that's like, no, I love my life. Please don't do this. <laughs> like, these are the types of stories of how intense this show got in its original thing, because this is such a traumatic choice that people actually make every day. Yeah. And I think it is a grander metaphor for theater in general. And I believe that it's either you dedicate it to it entirely until it kills you or you give up, settle down and move to Jersey. Letters do two choices if you're in theater. See, I don't I don't buy that. I don't like the interpretation of this is Pippin is an artist because Pippin is not an artist. Pippin never does anything at all. <laughs> Pippin is nothing. And that's the point. Pippin doesn't know what he wants. His his journey is finding what he wants to do. And I think the actual message is not that, oh, you should settle down with a girl you like. I think the actual message is you should find something you like to do and do it. I think that's not- why I was unsettled with the um, ending, because he just picked like this girl and like went off. When he really never found himself. And I think that's why I was. Well, I think up. he did find himself. Did that he, was that was what he wanted to be a farmer and, and a, <laughs> a houseman. Are you sure? He hated farming, though. Yeah, he did he say hated he farming hated as it. much as being a king. Sure, I guess. I mean, did he hate being a king? He did that twice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's frame it like this. <laughs> You go out and you try to be involved in like whatever you find passionate about. You go to New York, try to find yourself, try to figure out what you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You leave your shitty job at McDonald's and then you're like, "Uh, I'm done with that. I'm going out into the world. You do this, you do that. None of it satisfies you. And so you're given this choice to either like do this thing that might cause you physical damage or go back to your fucking McDonald's job and you See, go back to your McDonald's that's, job because you know though. that that's not what the it's show's saying answer. though because he doesn't go back to what he was doing at the start he does not go back to his shitty McDonald's job because if he did that he would still be a prince that's what he was doing at the start he he left that because he didn't like doing it <laughs> and he didn't go back to it so far, the only thing I think I saw Pippin enjoy in the entire musical was have sex with her. So maybe I'm leaning your way. Well, yeah, and I also think that, you know, the show is uh, literally being portrayed by and narrated by someone who is actively trying to lead Pippin into the fire. <laughs> so All right, we got to stop talking about just the end. We need to talk about some of these dance numbers. <laughs> OK, well, I mean, that's the important parts. The, it really is. Uh, I liked the um, the knife throwing. I liked the balancing act. I liked the grandma just in general. Um, I loved the grandma. I aspired to be her. <laughs> See, the grandma, she found what she likes and she didn't jump She in knew the what she liked. Am I able to tell an anecdote about it? The original production that's really sad. Mm-hmm. She died on stage. Yes. <gasps> Shut I up. Figured. Um, that, that's an apocryphal stage story. Um, I actually did my research today to because fa- that was what everyone told me for years. She like performed that song, then went off stage and died. <laughs> that was the story that spread all around Broadway. What had really happened is she performed her song, passed out backstage and then was sent back home to L.A. where she died a few weeks later. <laughs> OK, so it's not as it's romantic as that they didn't didn't drop her or something no (laughs) um in the original production it was just an actual old lady instead of the gorgeous andrea martin being dangled by a bunch of trapeze artists man i really i really like the stunts the stunts make the show um, the more recent 2013 production. And I, it, it is fearless of living in the shadow of Fosse. Like they pay tribute where necessary, but they don't feel like they have to replicate and they don't feel like they're deferent to him in a way that a lot of Fosse revivals are. 
when Charlemagne is throwing those knives at his wife, like, yeah, I had to look up like, is that fake? I don't think it was <laughs> fake. I don't think it was fake. I think he really no. did it. I agree. That's crazy. I also had to look up. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking crazy. That's like, so what cool. What if that went wrong? You got a dead corpse on care. stage and a lot of news stories. They don't you care. got a knife in a not so nice area. We saw where it went. <laughs> that would suck. He's he's a good. Uh, he's good. <laughs> Training. He's a good you get, if you train enough, you won't ever get it wrong. I like the I just, scene where all the demons were trying to have sex with Pippin and then he like <laughs> kept running away. He didn't embrace that, it. That's just Fosse trying to impose his like dirty sexual mind on a story that really didn't ask for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like there's so many of those like when there's just random swearing like this is bullshit and all that like it's like oh hi Fosse and I see you and I see you couldn't leave this be. <laughs> yeah, he he really uh around like midway through act 1 I think is where they just started like oh yeah, it's sex time. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Demon started did you pinching guys... his butt. <laughs> um, the war scene, where basically it's all represented through the Mason trio, and it's the leading player and two dancers. That might be one of my favorite dances I have ever seen in a Broadway show. And it's just such small moves, and it's the same co Fosse choreography, because you know not to fuck with what's great. <laughs> And I also bring that up because that was the very first Broadway commercial ever shot with actual like footage. Bob Fosse directed it himself and literally the announcer guys like, here's one minute of Pippin and they just show that dance. Pippin playing at the Winter Garden Theater or wherever it was. Are you talking about the scene where they like cut off the guy's head? I mean, that's part of it, but okay. literally just the oh, dancers in front. Yeah. OK, I thought that was really cool. I've never seen something like that on Broadway. <laughs> Where I literally like looked up and I thought a man's head was cut off. Um, I was like, oh, how'd they do that? Um, but yeah, okay, I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh, man, the dancing. There's so much dancing. I, how do you talk about dancing, though? Difficult. <laughs> it's very hard and not an easy thing you just kind of do. Um, can I have a uh, confession that might ruin my clout in the theater world? Oh, is it that you don't like dancing? It's that I didn't like this show for about most of it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not surprising. I think I messaged you while I was watching it, which, by the way, I thought it was fantastic the entire way through. Um, but I messaged you uh, while I was watching it and asked you how the fuck you liked it at all, because it's all just dancing. Well, um, I, it was a very hard watch for me and you the world as my like a reaction to it because I tweeted about it, which that tweet went slightly, slightly, slightly viral where I asked someone explain Pippin to me, please. I don't understand this. And then everyone in the world came up with their interpretations. And that was when I was only like halfway through the show. And then I got to the end. And I'm like, oh, I get it. I love this ending. I love what this ending says. I don't really want to watch this again. And then I proceeded to watch it four more times just to make sure I got it. How did you not follow the show? There's like no it's story not that I didn't at all. Follow it. It's just that I didn't understand the message yet. I, it's a message you don't get until you're there, if that makes sense, until you're there at the end, standing above the fire. Yeah, you're just looking too deep into it. Because, I mean, I think I got the message, but I also don't think the message matters. I think the dancing's what matters. I, I think, think the when, message is all that matters. I think you're wrong because they literally stop the entire show to dance and do tricks. Boys. <laughs> <Men>. <laughs> Settle your differences. You know well, what? That Jess is just incorrect all the time. <laughs> 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 you know what you know what i am incorrect but you know what Andrew? sometimes a dance is just a dance can we talk a little bit about greatness for a moment why does pippin think he's destined for greatness aside from the fact that he says he is uh like, royal bloodline yes aside from that like let's ignore all that <laughs> i mean i don't think you can ignore all that i feel like if you're from a royal bloodline you're expected to be great 
yeah, but he walks away from that. Um, the thing that bothers me a lot, like, well, more in this mo most recent production, but also in the original production to a certain extent, he is not very talented. Anytime he dances with anyone else, he is the worst one on stage, and they actively show that. He is the least talented, least charismatic, and he's there's an entire song like about how he's such a dick. Like, what do people see in him is kind of it. And what does he see in himself that makes him think, I am destined for great things, so that when it gets to the end and he's offered that choice, it is a downfall. There is nothing great about Pippin, aside from the fact that he says he is great. You know, Jess... Maybe there's nothing great about anyone besides from the fact that they say they're great. Maybe that's how I mean, Bob Fosse made it to where he was. I mean, no, but like, who are we to say who is and who is not destined for greatness? Aren't we all destined for the same things? I'm saying he wasn't talented enough to get any fame in any other way aside from suicide. That it was the only way because he had no natural talent, no natural charisma and nothing. He had no no opinions of his own he just did what he was told by the devil on his shoulder but that's not true if he was seeking fame he found it he, he rejected it he killed his father became the king he did it because it wasn't an easy answer and then in the end he takes the easy answer but he doesn't take the easy answer again the easy answer is jumping to the fire <laughs> Time to start our new segment where we get to hear how the people in 1970s thought about Pippin. How is Jess so wrong about this show? I don't understand it. I see it from both perspectives. Now I got to read this thing that Jesse's making me do. It's time for our brand new segment, Brie Views, where Brie reads us the reviews of when this show originally hit Broadway and tells us whether or not the critics agree with Jess or Andrew. Oh, shit, Andrew, that's why he's sticking to his uh, story, because he knows what the critics said. He knows that a bunch of fucking snobs in the 1970s <laughs> wrote in their newspaper. <laughs> I agree with Jess. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I want to put music here. Breeze view. And then there's music. It's apply. breeze views. Breeze views. Um, OK, and if I mess any of this up, it's because I've had two glasses of wine and I'm a lightweight. OK, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Uh, when the new musical opened on October 23rd, 1972, the Broadway's Imperial Theater critics lavished praise on Fosse's work and largely dismissed Schwartz's contribution. Clive Barnes, writing the New York Times Review, raved about everything but the feeble book and the bland music, while his Times colleague Walter Kerr wrote, Pippin is almost entirely an exercise in style. And it, uh, it is a commonplace set to rock music, and I must say I found the most of the music somewhat characterless. It is nevertheless consistently tuneful and contains a few rock ballads uh, that could prove memorable. John Simon in, in The New Yorker described short songs as having awkward and amateurish charm. Many critics made fun of the slight book, which Fosse had made all the slighter through extensive ridiculed the seeker story and belittled its conclusion. For Schwartz, negative remarks overshadowed any positives. The response to the show, he recalls, was very annoying and hurtful to me because some of the things we got blamed for were things we had no control over. They were things that Bob Fosse did. Theater critic Peter Filchai comments, Schwartz score was one of the most influential to those who were young actors, young composer, lyricists, and young theatergoers in the 1970s. There is no question that Bob Fosse's contribution to Pippin were invaluable. But more to the point, if he had not had the songs to work with, he wouldn't have had any magic to do. See, I, I made it even between us. Like, there's some praise, some criticism, but I agree with most of that. Like, I don't think Schwartz's songs live up to the entirety of the rest of it. And the dancing, as well as Fosse does it, is just all there really was to it. And the 2013 production does the best it can to add icing to what is basically an underbaked cake with like all these fancy stunts. But still all together, it's still an underbaked cake. Well, see, no. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's not a story. It is a hodgepodge of things happening. And sometimes I love that. But here, I don't feel like it's as intentional as it tries to frame itself. Jess. I just got to I have to say something. This show. This show is what cats should have been. 
I agree with you there. <laughs> this show is a dancing show, and I feel like there is a place in theater for dancing shows. Not every show has to be some dramatic, like, story piece. Sometimes you can just dance. This just wasn't dancing, though. This was acrobats and circus It movies. was impressive stuff. It was very impressive and, stuff. And Jess looks at that and he goes, oh, well, <laughs> there was no story. Dancing? That's not a talent. <laughs> I didn't say that. any of that shit, for one. <laughs> You do, though. I mean, you've said it. We've Everyone has heard you say it. I have never said that. Heard it with my own ears. Jess has literally said that he doesn't believe dancing is a talent. I have never fucking said that, you motherfucker. Hey, guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a shill at you. And also, I want to bring up that today's show was um, a Patreon request by our wonderful patron, Kyle, who wanted us to cover Pippin. So this one's for you, Kyle. We love you, Kyle. Yeah, Andrew, Kyle, thanks for us. making me watch this. I loved it. I loved it. Loved it. It's wonderful. So, Andrew, why don't you tell us who else is supporting us on Patreon and what they get? <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. Here's the list. Um, well, we're actually putting out some more Patreon content. We're, we're, we're getting back into the swing. Uh, so you expect uh, we're doing dance numbers. We're doing uh, just acrobatics. Okay, don't say that horseshit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are we actually we doing? We, we have a commentary on... Is this Phantom out Phantom right of the now? Opera. Oh, this is out right now. Yeah. Phantom of the Opera. Um, we won't With tell you Robert which England. version. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to watch people get slaughtered with us, then there's that. Um, um, we they also get their the video version of these podcasts. They get to see our beautiful faces and all our wacky outfits and all the possibly, cut material. Yep, possibly my head getting cut off. <laughs> um, they are also this is a brand new thing for our ten dollar patrons, and this is the first Breeze hearing about it, but she has to be there. Um, so once a month, we will be doing a Discord meetup with all of our ten dollar and up Patreon people, where we're gonna play some games and have a discussion, and it'll have all three of us there: me, Andrew, Bree. It's gonna be a lot of fun, where you get to have one on one Facetime with all of us. Well, it's actually so not one on one because there's gonna be like a lot of people there, but it's gonna be Facetime with all of us. <laughs> So you don't want to miss it. We got Jackbox games. We're going to play Brent's game. We're going to play Brent's game. Use your words. It's going to be a lot of fun. Who's donating, Andrew? Say it already. Our current patrons are Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lear, Lily Ackles, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, Jess. Whoa, this, we got a new new name. Jess the Stampede. Are they changing it up again? Uh, once again, it is changed up. All right, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Teskir, Fire of September, Mina Maniri, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Alice in Wonderland, B-Way Flicks, Nathaniel Stacy Tacoom, Luna Rocks 222, Irigail Drouet Whiter, Carrie Ahern, Christine Malmadel, Mezzanine Theater Diary, Mary Lou Choquette, and Nunnally, Cole Birchfield, John Vanells, Holy Stacali, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Grace, Andrew Van Barson, Emily Stack, Kyle Summers, Jessica A, Mr. B, Janae C, Kyle, Christina Francis, Skyler, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmarth, Allison Stuller, Nothing is Certain Except Beth and Taxes, Ren Cullen, Thespian, uh, Elizabeth Levengood, Victoria Tribble, Alex, Joseph Evans Green. I feel like I've said that already, but maybe not. Uh, Wait in the Wings and Jamie Holland. And they give us financial support to help us out and hire Bree. And if you want Bree to keep being employed here like I do, keep supporting us on Patreon or tell your friends to do it. Yes, please do that. I don't have a job right now. It's only this. <laughs> this is the job. This is this my is only job. job, please. She's keep about to get evicted. Us. And that's why Bree's going to 100% be with us on our Discord meetings because she I loves will, having money. We barely pay her. It's incredible. <laughs> it is actually <laughs> incredible. All right, let's get back to the show, everyone. All right, can we talk about that opening number magic to do? Let's talk about that opening number. Yes, that opening number. Let's talk oh, about that, it. That Opening, opening number. number. Mm, mm, mm. Opening Follow number. us on Patreon if you want to see these cool <laughs> fucking dance moves, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, Magic To Do is a great, great scene. Did it, did it, did it. 
to see to study Battles, barbarous and bloody Join us, sit where everybody can see We've got magic to do Just for you We've got miracle ways to play We've got hearts to perform Hearts to war Kings and kings to take my score As we go along our way I love the leading player. Like a lot. Bring out the... Bring out the really like the, the, the character that's won two Tonys for two different actors of different genders. Yeah, that's your favorite character. You don't say. Yeah, no. But I mean, I think that the the way that they do it with like they don't they're not explicit with what the framing device actually is until the end of the show. Like the way they start it, it's like, oh, they're just it's an acting troupe and they're just putting on a show. And it's I think it's really cool. And then as it goes in, it's like, wait. These people are like actually interfering with his life. Wait. <laughs> yeah, it is a very <laughs> blurred line between reality and how much they can interact with Pippin and how much they know is going on and how much is a show and how much isn't. And here it's basically like it's a magic trick. Don't give a shit. Yeah. And, and they set up that that uh, the ending is going to happen and they even show you what the ending is, but then they don't. <laughs> I like it's that the leading stuff. player is scary, like always scary. Um, I don't know if they're always scary, but they're definitely always like. They they seem to have an ulterior motive, and even when you don't know what that is. Yeah, and then it, they get they get progressively threatening. more threatening through the show. What do you it's think? It's very Bri? cool. I loved as she's the leading player is that what it's called yes okay so i absolutely loved her um and when i read that uh, motown music had an influence or had you know helped supported this musical um i absolutely saw it the way she sang and she was great loved her um but in the original original production it was played by a man ben vereen and it was changed to be a woman in the more recent production and I find that interesting. I think it works better as a woman just because I prefer the way the songs sound with a female voice. I, well, I've never seen the other one, but I agree because I, lo- I really loved her voice. I think the role itself could work either way. But yeah, the songs probably work better with the female singing. She was so strong. Like she was such a strong character and like she also had the voice to back it. And she's also easily seductive. Like I hate to use that kind of horrible framing but she is seductive Jess, to are you like saying any men gender. can't be seductive because there's a lot of seductive men in this show i don't think that he, that role can be seductive in the same way if it's a man fair enough and it's hard for me to watch that original production without just seeing ben vereen doing cosplay as bob fossey <laughs> literally wearing the vest and the dark clothing and the beard and all that i'm just like okay he wrote his self-insert character right here uh, I feel like Pippin is also his self-insert character, so I don't really know. No, that is know. Steven Schwartz's self-insert character. I don't know. He, everybody's a self-insert for Bob Fosse. Does he even write shows about other people? Cabaret. <laughs> I think that's the closest, but he didn't even do that. He directed the movie. The show already existed. Yeah. Also, he might be a secret Nazi. We don't know. I don't think so. Mm, Andrew needs to make so. it further into Fosse verse. <laughs> okay, next song, Corner of the Sky. Love this. Okay. <laughs> Love this. Everything has its season. Everything has its time. Show me a reason and I'll soon show you a rhyme. Cats fit on the windowsill. Children fit in the snow. So why do I feel I don't fit in anywhere I go? Tell 
Tell me. It's Tell me good. about it. Is this the I Want song? It is 100% the I Want song. It See, is the second song in the musical. Of course it's the I Want song. I'm learning. I'm learning <laughs> about so, musicals. He's... See, it's important to know the structure because every good show breaks it, which is why this is a bad show. No, that is not true. <laughs> Mostly it's the bad shows that break the structure. Shut up, Jess. You love the SpongeBob musical and you know it. I do love the SpongeBob musical. That follows the structure to a T. What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Shut up, Jess. You love... <laughs> We will rock you. <laughs> I do not. Stop putting this shit out into the world. I, at least say one that might that might make sense, like fucking Buffett. I was defending that shit. Uh, Corner of the Sky is pretty good. It's just the right amount of uh, bland wantness. He also comes <laughs> back to it, like, I feel like three times within the show. Like, he just starts singing it again. Well, that's just like his calling card. But let's talk a bit about composer Stephen Schwartz, because we've been focusing a lot on Bob Fosse as much as that is apt. We need to talk yeah. about Stephen Schwartz. This is not our first Stephen Schwartz musical. Andrew, can you name us our, any of our other ones? Uh, Wicked? Yeah, he did do Wicked. I think that's the only one I know offhand. Hunchback, he did the lyrics for. Okay. And the one I see the most in here, because he was still kind of in his baby pictures phase, was Children of Eden. I hear that a lot in oh, Corner yeah, of the yeah, Sky, yeah, yeah. in fact. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that one. Um, that one wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you said it was OK in the actual episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, OK and not very good are kind of the same thing. They're just framed in different ways. It was you think okay. Pippin is better. It was okay is the positive way of saying that it wasn't very good. <laughs> Damn. But I feel the Stephen Schwartzness a lot here. It feels a lot like The Wizard and I and The Spark of Creation. Like, yeah. musically, they feel very hand-in-hand because, hand you know, Stephen Schwartz isn't that great at diversely writing music. Yeah, all he is able to write is... Um commonplace rock music that's yeah. somewhat characterless i like steven schwartz <laughs> but he but can maybe write a few rock ballads that are memorable <sighs> he he's very good at disney songs i'll say that prince of egypt he he was wonderful at like all the that's songs not in a prince disney of movie egypt. i thought that was totally a disney movie that's a dreamworks no, that's movie dreamworks oh just, i just, just saw it for it the up. first time like a uh, last year, so. Can you, you know hear the Steven Schwartzness in this and in that? Yeah, I do. You know, a song I really liked is uh, "War Is a Science." We got like twenty songs before then. Hold on. What are you talking? There's literally one song in between this song and that one. Fair. All right, "War Is a Science." <laughs> <laughs> General accepts that war is hell or even worse He must never be too cautious or casualty averse I'm certain the majority of blood that you will spatter Will be there through just a minimum of damage that's collateral But we know for success, we must always pay a price That's why for my success, you must sacrifice I disagree with the, you on this song, this song bothers me a lot Seriously, I love that it is consistently building up To the, the big ending, like the big chorus at the end Right. And, and he keeps not doing it. <laughs> it's one joke. It's one joke over I and know. over. I know, but I love musical jokes. I love them. <sighs> well, let's talk about back about our Sondheim talk. You say that there is a sound of funny music. Yes. Does this have that? Yeah. It's now tension, we... tension, tension. No release. Tension, tension, tension. No release. Tension, tension, tension. No release. And then just keep doing that. And then finally, he fucking gets to it. And even when he gets to it, he still takes a break before he does it. <laughs> <laughs> I still I I just find this song like meandering because the entire show is meandering. So at this point, I'm just frustrated. Like, what's what what's going on? Why do I care? What's going on is that Pippin fucking keeps fucking everything up and he can't even do the dance moves right. <laughs> and Charlemagne won't refuses 
to <laughs> to sing the ver- the final verse <laughs> until he gets everything perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I thought it was really funny. I really think I was laughing. <laughs> you know what? I, I was like, how, was many funny. T- how many times are they going to do it? And he just keeps doing it. Over You're selling me on this song that I know I didn't like. Every time, every single time, it's like, OK, it was funny, but he's not going to do it. Oh, my God, he's doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Bri? <laughs> It wasn't very memorable for me, but now that you're selling me on the song, I guess I liked it. It had meaning. (laughs) The thing is, it had no meaning. It It just made Andrew laugh like a child. It's like King Herod's song from Jesus Christ Superstar. Fucking useless. Throw it out. King Herod's song is phenomenal. Fuck (laughs) you. It's so funny. You just love your cheese. I will love my cheese until the end of time. And this musical is like almost all cheese. So. <laughs> do you like um, Andrew? Do you like Weird Al and like musicians that make comedic music? My problem with Weird Al is he doesn't make comedic music. He makes comedic lyrics. OK, yeah. Um, and Andrew hates lyrics. He doesn't listen to lyrics. He just I hears do not the music. Listen to lyrics. My favorite uh, comedy musician is Neil Sessiergo, and I've talked about him before. Um, but the way he does comedy music is is phenomenal. Because he just mixes songs together that don't make any sense. So, like, you'll just be listening to a song and then, like, suddenly, like, a Linkin Park song just drops into it. And it's just like, what? (laughs) His best piece, his best piece is Imagine by Elton John with the lyrics of All Star over top of it. And it blends so beautifully. That's a really good one. (laughs) That's a really good one. I think his more complex ones are pretty good, though, as well. Like, uh... He has a song that is it's called best and it's just the choruses are every song that has a chorus with the word best in it just all mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Space Monkey Mafia, which is like uh, uh, it's the end of the world as we know it. And uh, what's that one Billy Joel song? We didn't start the fire just playing on top of each other. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> It's like a nightmare to listen to, if I'm being completely honest. It absolutely is. That's why <laughs> that's that's what we funny all try music it? sounds like. I don't know. Can we all try it on the count of three? Can we all? <laughs> well, the thing about Andrew, we've had this fight before when we were talking about sound time. I live by lyrics. I always live by lyrics. And Steven Schwartz is great with music. His lyrics are fine and passable. I don't see anyone really talking up how great pocahontas's music is though or prince of egypt because it isn't wicked is an effective piece it is not an effective really? pocahontas has some pretty piece. good music in my opinion well, the music is by alan menken the lyrics is by steven schwartz i don't think oh, okay. the lyrics well, yeah, are I don't any know. good i don't give a fuck about the lyrics the, the, i was talking about the music but <laughs> but you don't like sondheim because all the comedy in sondheim is in the lyrics and you'd never listen to the lyrics i mean if i listen to it enough times eventually i get it like uh uh, what's the one song? A little Fucking Priest. Little Priest, which is all puns. That's funny. Um, the thing is, when he does li- when he does the jokes that are like in those wicked fast songs, like I can't catch that. I can I because it's just pfft, over my head, gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that bothers me because Camp Getting Married, like I'm not getting married today, is a brilliant song, and you just listened to it once and was like, it fell over me. I didn't give a shit. It wasn't funny. I didn't get it. <laughs> <sighs> Let's talk about glory briefly. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Praise be to Charles, our Lord. Triumphant is his sword. Allegiance. Yeah, this is a weird one. It's a little dark for where it is in the show, in my opinion, but I love the way it sounds like as a piece of the the album. It's great. I like the sound of it, but it's like, man, we're really getting right into it, huh? And then it's just not even dark after that, really. I don't know. I guess I guess it is war, though, and and war is a science, so. (laughs) 
<laughs> like literally you don't give a shit about anything unless it makes you chuckle. That's, you know, it depends on the show, but that's part of it. Yes. That's fair. What I mean, it's not one I really thought about, but it's one that everyone talks about. I like the music in, in Glory. I think the melody is quite good. Mm -hmm. I have to agree uh, there. Let's talk about No Time At All, um, the grandmother song. What good is a field on a fine summer night If you sit all alone with the weeds Or a succulent pear If with each juicy bite You spit out your teeth with the seeds Before it's too late Stop trying to wait For fortune and fate you're secure of For there's one thing to be sure of, mate There's nothing to be sure I don't even know if there's much to say about the song. I like that they have the audience sing along with it because it is a mildly catchy chorus. Um, though, if you ask me to sing it right now, it's not I'm just not going to be able to do it. Oh, it's time to start living. Time to get back on the first word. I don't even, see, I, I don't even think you're singing the melody right. I don't even think you're singing the melody right. <laughs> <laughs> it's close enough. And I only saw it once, so. It's like, what is it? Oh, it's time to start living. Da, 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 Time to take like stock in the t time we're given or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. But really, I'm, she steals the show with the, the acrobatics. Yes. Yeah. And like, she like pops into some lingerie. You don't even care about the song. It's just like, OK, whatever, like. What is happening here? <laughs> yeah. And then she never shows up again. It's That's true. true. <laughs> she never shows up again. <laughs> Probably because she's on a, a trip back to L.A. to die, <laughs> to die horribly <laughs> of malnutrition. <laughs> <laughs> on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, on the right track as in the song. <laughs> I thought you were talking about her dying of malnutrition. <laughs> this episode is a beautiful mess and I love it. All right. Good just... luck editing, Brie. If you take it easy, trust a while. Don't look blue. Don't look back. Flustered, keep those hopes aloft. Keep cool as custard, trying hard, stepping soft. There's no trick to staying sensible despite each call the sack, cause each step's indispensable when you're Jess, what did you think of this song? I, think I love this song every in every version. Like, this is the first song I actually heard from Pippin, aside from, like, Corner of the Sky, because everyone heard Cor Corner of the Sky. Yeah. And not that it's a bad thing, but that was just the most ubiquitous song from that show. Well, that's On the, the right big rock ballad, the memorable rock ballad. Yeah, it's the memory of this show. Yeah, so... I just think that this song is an interstitiary song, and one of the rare times where you actually see the devil quote-unquote like yeah tick, like the thoughts going through his brain and like all right let's get on to it and also i think the lyrics um as much as i critique stephen schwartz as having very slight lyrics um i think they really stand out here yeah i think it's a good way to kick off act two 
Uh, I'm not sure if you have any comment on this, actually. I was reading the Wikipedia and I guess this is usually done in one act. Is this is that true? Yes, and it should be done in one act or else the story just feels wrong. <laughs> Okay. I think it's bad. It's done a disservice by being broken up. But people want to have that two hour experience for some reason. So they want to break it up into two acts. I don't know about you, but I'd rather just sit through one long act. Yeah, I think what's a bit weird with. Um, the way it is done is that the act one finale. Is well, he, he kills his dad. Yes. And then this is where. He's in the throne room and it's just kind of they just kind of throw this away. It's just like, eh, well, you know, that's one ending. But what if we did this? <laughs> and they just are like, nope. <laughs> Andrew, I'm going to talk in <laughs> horror movie terms for you <laughs> yeah, and sure. see if that makes sense. Have you seen Funny Games? I've not actually seen Funny Games. I do know what it's about, though. I love that movie. That might be one of my favorite horror movies. But like two thirds through the movie, like the the good guys get the upper hand on the killers. She gets the shotgun and shoots one of them. And one of them's like, no, that's not how this works. Grabs a remote, rewinds it and then stops that from happening. <laughs> rewinds the entire movie. And that's what I kept thinking when that happened. It was like, oh, they just pulled a funny games. Yeah, they're just like. But in this, it's a little different, though, because when you have an act one finale, you're like, oh, this is what act two is going to be about. Right. And then right. it's just like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work. You cut it. Just leave it as one act. It is short enough if you cut all the fucking dancing. And <laughs> you see, but then then you're removing the actual purpose of it. What they should do is cut more of the story. Uh, so cut the ending um, and get rid of like the king stuff and just make them dance more. <laughs> okay i have a question though about this like right when this happens so kills his father and then it almost seems like his stepmom is like supporting him was she supposed to be like i thought she didn't like him she doesn't well like she him. wanted her son to be the next in line and either if he died she's her son would be the last in line and if she he gets killed by the king he's the next in line well so either way, i she mean won. if she came out against him and he's the king i feel like uh it wouldn't go very well for her right and i figured that <laughs> but like in the next two or like so i think it is right when he kills his father that song and then the song after, she's like right there, like singing along about the king. And like, so is her son. And I was just a little thrown off. I was like, I figured she didn't like him. Well, she she doesn't, though. I mean, she even says like, oh, it's it's like nothing's even changed since your father died. Like sarcastically, like because he's not doing a good job. Right. I mean, no one could do a good job in any political <laughs> field, I believe. Well, yeah, but he just he he takes all of his promises and he just goes back on all of them. It's like it's like he became king and suddenly building the wall was a little too expensive. So he decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Can we talk very briefly on this very small, probably forgettable to everyone that is in me song that I love so much called I Guess I'll Miss the Man. I'll miss the man Explain it if you can His face was far from fine But still I'll miss his face And wonder if he's missing mine Some days he wouldn't say a pleasant word all day. Some days this is this is the one where Catherine isn't supposed to sing and she is right. And she yes. does. Right. I, and like I think this, this song one. is beautiful. Yeah, she's breaking, breaking from the script. Right. This is this is the best story song in the show. And it's my favorite song in the show. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Why does it not surprise me, Jess? <laughs> it makes me mad that none of these songs push forward plot it really does <laughs> except for this one and fun fact in the 1982 filmed version of this this song is cut <laughs> well i mean yeah it's not necessary it's just it's just story 
We could have put more dancing here. Motherfucker, I'll... We could have put more dancing here. <laughs> <laughs> it breaks my heart because it is so true to, like, a lot of unpleasant relationships where, yeah, I'll miss him, but that doesn't mean I loved every moment I spent with him. Yeah. You know, Catherine really gets the shaft in this show. Pippin shaft. Well, yeah. It's double entendre. A whole lot of that. Uh, I like that the the leading player is actively saying like that she's not allowed to have a voice in the show. Um, that's really cool. And um, I think that's the reason why Pippin falls in love with her is because she kind of deviates and he's been too scared to deviate and she's not. Yep. And that's why he, he doesn't jump in the fire and then the end. Can I ask a question about this character, Catherine? Did you sure. guys notice her in the first act? Um, no. Yes. Well, I didn't. I noticed her when it was obvious, like when she came out in the clown suit with her son. Yes. She was a clown in act one, just wandering around confused and not knowing where to go. Yes. Which I thought was a really that was smart her? move. Yeah. Yeah. I should make uh, these full screen next time I watch them. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop minimizing it while I'm trying to watch the dancing. <laughs> I was wondering who that was. Yeah, she came out with her son in a clown suit. I noticed her son. I didn't notice her. <laughs> and that would go on to be Tony winner Rachel Bay Jones um, for Dear Evan Hansen, everyone's favorite musical. I still haven't seen it. It's not good. That's what I heard. All right. I think that's all we have to say about the music, guys. I think so. So I guess there's only thing to ask. What is your overall thoughts and your cheese rating, guys? Can I share my screen? Because I have the cheese I want um, you guys to see. Oh, my go goodness. For Cheers. That I, that I picked um, for this. It's a demonic cheese. Um, demonic cheese. Very... Very evil. Can you see that? <laughs> what the hell? That's so terrible. I love it. What type of cheese? Just nightmare cheese? Is that what it is? Yeah, this, that's the I, I chose um, nightmare cheese. OK, there you go. And if you're watching this, you're welcome. If you're yeah. listening, I'm sorry. OK, I'm done. You can go, guys, go ahead. <laughs> What is your thoughts on the show, though? That's important. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to show you guys the cheese. Um, I actually <laughs> like it. <laughs> I was excited to show you the cheese. Um, I like the show. I like the music, even though you guys said it was blah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I didn't say it was blah. Oh, well, Jess said it was blah. Um, <laughs> I'm salty about it. About it. Um, no, I, I really liked it. Uh, this story arc to me and the character arc to me was a little um blase it was just kind of boring throughout and then like the end kind of got me um but i i really enjoyed the music overall and i don't really know much about musicals so i'm sorry if i sound like an idiot andrew are you ready to sound like an idiot oh yes as <laughs> always but we'll leave the real idiocy for the end so you can go last jess um Ooh, ooh, uh, I like this show a lot. Um, I really like the the demons. I love all of the fucking weird parlor tricks. Uh, I like the dance numbers uh, and I like just I like the tone of it a lot. Just the the overall kind of uh, dark carnival like feel is very fun. Uh, I very much enjoy it um, as far as a cheese. Uh, I'm going to try to give it one I've not given it before because apparently people are upset with how lazy my cheeses are. And by uh, people, he means me. Yes. So I'm going to give it a uh, ricotta cheese, which I don't believe I've ever given it, um, which is because uh, ricotta is just it's a fluffy cheese. And I feel like this show is nothing but fluff. So there you go. I I know I sound like I've been a negative Nelly on the show and sorry about that, but I like the overall intention of it. I love the ending. The ending makes it all, all feel so much better, like 
when it happens, I'm like, oh, did I love this show? And then I watch it again. I'm like, nah, nah. <laughs> and it's very rough for it to find a production that works. I think the most recent ending is the most effective version of the show we've had so far. But it still kind of has a lot of them kinks from the Bob Fosse 1970s production that it still can't get away from i hope maybe in 10 15 years we'll have like an oklahoma style rejuvenation of the show maybe like where they're like all right fuck fossey fuck all that noise we're gonna destroy this shit and make it brand new um until that day i feel like it'll still be a middling show with a lot of very very high highs and the lows are very low so my cheese rating is a four corners cheese because there's four corners of the sky to go to go cheat. Check out. Did they, did they say how many corners there were? There's at least four corners of the sky, guys. There could be more than four corners to something, Jess. If, it's, if the sky was a big circle, which I would argue it kind of is, there's actually infinite corners. You know who else has infinite corners? <laughs> Our wonderful patrons, thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter, at Cheesy Musicals. Our Patreon is Musicals with Cheese. Our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese. Oh my we God. have a patron-only <laughs> podcast called Patreon with Cheese, where we're talking about Fosse Verdon at the moment, and it's going to be lit as fuck. Ooh, baby. So it's kind of relevant for this, huh? Yeah, yeah. Andrew's going to learn about Pippin and how it got created. I think that episode should actually be posted right now. With this one, the oh, Pippin yeah. episode. Pip, pip, so cheerio, everything baby. will come together. Um, we're also at this moment in time, you'll have a full length commentary of the fan of the opera 1989 posted. And that's going to be a lot of fun, which has the best phantom song <laughs> in any phantom of the opera. I agree with that. Um, once, <laughs> once again, me and Andrew agree. Um, email us at musical theater lives at gmail dot com because, you know, we, we love emails. We just got a really nice one about our fun home um, episode, which really made me happy. So uh, I love getting just happy emails. Our title card is created by the amazing Jolene Casco. This show is produced by the amazing Brianna Jones. And today is her birthday that we're recording it. And she's still here with us because she oh, loves I'm so us. So happy to be here. We don't pay her anything. I That's just not true. Drink wine and <laughs> sound like an idiot talking about podcasts. It's great. Twenty five no, is great. No, no, t- come on, guys. Tell her she doesn't sound like an idiot. Go oh send her God. some love I on her Twitter. About musical theater. End the show. We have another one to do. A total card is created by the amazing Jolene Casco. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform. We love you guys so much. Um, yeah, that's all. Andrew, do you have anything left to say before we wrap this on up? Will you have a grand finale? I'm just, jumping just, in the fire. Let's go. Just Whee! have a thought on it. <laughs> and all right. that's it from Musicals with Cheese. Everyone has its reason, everyone has its time. You give me a reason, I'll give you a rhyme.